welcome to the Train Like a King podcast, your go-to source for all things paddling. Get inspired to hit the water with expert insights and motivation. Visit Train Like a King for training plans, paddles, merchandise and more. Don't miss out, follow and subscribe to stay tuned for every episode. Hey guys, welcome back to another Train Like a King podcast episode. On this episode, I'm going to be answering your questions, part two. Ask me anything. There was a while ago I put up a question box. The last episode, I got through a handful of questions and we covered 40 minutes. So this is part two. I'll do my best to get through the questions. Not sure if we're going to require a part three. I have my good mic back, so I hope that you appreciate the audio that's coming through. Now, this podcast is available not just on Spotify, but it's also available on YouTube and Apple Podcasts. Both Spotify and YouTube have the audio and the video, so not much to really watch other than me talking to the screen. But if you haven't already, please press subscribe or follow on Spotify or YouTube and leave us a review, you know, leave us a rating, leave us a review on Spotify, leave us a comment, whatever, if you're listening, um, it all, all helps to let me know that you're, you're listening and, and, uh, that we're getting some value to you. So the last question that I finished the last episode on was how many kilometers do I do? Do I paddle during the week? So if you want to hear the answer to that, go back to the previous episode and have a listen, but we're going to pick up where we left off and jump straight back into your questions, unlocking my training secrets. Now I know training secrets around here, but let's see where we are. The first question is main difference between a Timmy and a Fi. Now, Although I don't have a lot of experience on a Timmy, I've only been on a Timmy cup maybe once or twice. My father did own a Jacques canoe, which is very similar to the Timmy, I would say. So I would say that the the Timmy overall volume is smaller. And I think that the, the rocker of the Timmy or the banana underneath it is a little bit straighter than the Fai. So... All I can say is that the Timmy potentially tracks a straighter line, especially in the flat. However, usually that means that when it comes to surf, there's a, it's a little bit more difficult to control and maneuver the canoe because of that straight rocker. The other thing to take into account is that the, the less volume may not accommodate heavier paddlers you know the fire has a little bit more volume so and maneuverability because of the the rocker underneath so it may be easier for us heavier paddlers to navigate a a fi especially in in surf so i mean it's it's pretty hard to to compare but both canoes have been really successful there's been successful paddlers on both there's been champions in, in the fire. There's been champions in the Timmy, like Steve and, and Rete, you know. So it comes down to preference. But for me, being a heavier paddler, I, I prefer the fire. And I I love the the fact that the fire can be paddled in any conditions. Flat, surf, headwind, sidewind. And yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty good. Especially the 4SI now. The 4SI, love the volume on that. So yeah, that's that. Do you use different paddles to train with versus race? Personally, when I paddle in the single, I don't necessarily use different paddles. I just use the one that I'm that suits me best. However, in the six man, I think it can be beneficial to use, say, bigger bigger blades or longer blades because that that basically is a form of resistance training, you know, and it teaches you to use the bigger muscles of the body, you know, so that when you do switch back to smaller paddles for the race, then you're going to you're going to be better developed. I would say the reason why it's good for six man is that 
in the six man seat one to seat five all their job is paddling front to back front to back you're not doing angle strokes adjustment strokes like you would be in a v1 so in a v1 it's not near not as beneficial because you're, you're trying to develop the skill to paddle the v1 you know it's, it's hard enough trying to steer it with a normal paddle let alone a big long paddle i don't think the translation is it's going to be that good whereas in the six man i think it's really good i think it's really good options you know uh i know that the likes of shelva they they train with longer bigger wooden paddles in their training alongside their they do a bit of pvc you know bungee type weight training and that's going to build you know six man specific uh, strength and and power and ultimately endurance and then when they switch to their racing paddles boom so yep you can do that i don't paddle a lot of six man but um yeah it's a good good idea what training do you do to improve technique so I would say the best time to practice your technique is when you're doing your low intensity endurance paddles, aerobic endurance paddles, because it's low intensity. This is where you can test out, test things a little easier. You know, when it's, when you're sprinting or when you're working intensely, it's difficult to maintain form and technique. So it's better to do it, you know, really practice it in your aerobic paddles and then just try and maintain it as much as possible in your intervals and and sprints well there's there's a few drills out there that people tend to do like you know maybe there's a couple like pausing at the back slightly just to feel the glide of the canoe before you take the next stroke that's that's one drill even when you're returning to the front of the stroke making sure that you know you're smooth everything's smooth you're not bouncing the canoe what's another drill I guess there's some form of like you could pause at the front of your stroke but this this is good as well but sometimes pausing at the front of the stroke can be bad because I believe it like kills your momentum it it doesn't allow you to use the the energy of your body coming forward and then you placing the pedal in that's like a free free bit of energy right there just like coming through and placing your paddle because even though you haven't even started to pull back on the pedal yet, even the the force of of placing the pedal kind of in the downward motion, you're already starting to create lift and a little bit of propulsion in that in that phase. So if there's too much of a dramatic pause, like a set drive, you're not going to get that that's that uh, bit of free energy using your body. Now, you there's still the, still the importance of establish like getting a good catch and being kind of caution cautionary at the catch because you don't want to just be like plopping or going crazy but but there's still the ability to come forward use the energy and you know really apply good catch and power into the front of the stroke to create that what i call like almost free energy really if your arm wants to come back to you you want to pl you place weight on that that pedal it's gonna inevitably start coming back to you because because of the the natural movement of the arms and and the body you know and the shoulders the shoulder joint you see, even though you, you're, you're starting to ply down the pedal starts to work back to you so what was that question technique yeah okay moving on when will you come back to brazil I'm not too sure if i'll get back to brazil this year i'd love to come back for the mola cabra and fortaleza however the world's in uh, next year Niteroi. so might have to wait till then otherwise who knows i've only really planned up to hilo this year not sure what the rest of the year brings so it could could make an appearance back over there if it's yeah if it's worth it uh how did you get sponsored now i first got sponsored by thai paddles shout out to thai paddles who we now have a collaboration with after 10 years of of paddling using thai paddles you know helps that he's a teammate and uh, a mentor as well over the last 10 years conan herbert and my other longtime sponsor five r they've been with me for 10 years i would say how do you the way that you get sponsored is is basically just you know train hard train hard put the time in go to as many races as possible 
try and get you know you don't have to be winning but you just have to be consistently competing and and i guess showing improvement you know people will notice that people will notice that and and if they people will want to invest in your journey you know if you if you get you know motivate yourself enough to to put in the work and if if you have you, you got to have a vision too you know and if if you have a vision and you're determined to achieve it people will notice that and that like i said they'll invest in that invest their time in you now i will also say that the easiest way to do that is also to kind of market yourself and the, the easiest form of marketing is just basically you know taking a gopro taking a gopro out there on the water with you because and and just and just filming your paddling sessions like that's how i started the youtube channel years and years ago over 10 years ago now um i just would take a gopro on my down ones you know a lot of you listening the ogs that's that's what i do i used to make some pretty long videos it's funny these days it's all short short real type videos but you know bringing back some long form videos in the form of these podcasts so hope you guys enjoy that but um yeah market yourself don't be afraid don't be like don't be like oh no nah, i don't want to film myself and whatever like at the end of the day there's going to be people who you know really enjoy watching your stuff and and that's all you know that's all that matters if it helps grow the sport no sport started off as a professional elite olympic sport it all started at the grassroots level and it you know there are people who help it grow and there are people who just compete and and whatever but i'd rather be one of the persons that help the sport grow even though <laughs> it may not be in my prime I might be 80 years old looking back and thinking, wow, it's an Olympic sport now. People get paid to do this full time. <laughs> That's the dream. And uh, it would be good to say that I had a little part in it, even if it is just YouTube videos. Moving on, what's your pace and average beats per minute? I guess that's heart rate on a V1's OC1 for middle to long distances. Pace always changes, eh? Pace changes. Like People get caught up on... Oh, you know 50 stroke rates per minute got to keep that but if you keep to that then you're not going to have the ability to like produce the power necessary to catch a wave and thus get your speed up and then you're not going to have the ability to to recover from that push if you don't allow your stroke rate to come back down you know so rather than having a set pace well I, it depends what you mean by pace but in terms of stroke rate you need the ability to go up and then you need the ability to come down and recover. Now, I guess the same, even if you're thinking about pace in terms of speed, it's the same idea. You need the ability to go up and chase the wave, catch it, take your speed up to 13, 14, 15 kilometers an hour, whatever it is. But then you're going to come back down, you know. So rather than saying, oh, I'm just going to keep. I guess if you aim for an average, if you're trying to aim for an average, I know that a good average is about 12 kilometers an hour. But most of the time you need... A little bit of help you're not going to achieve that in a in a headwind but you know maybe you'll get there in really good flat water conditions maybe i know that uh kevin for the ti tour he's one year i'm i did a bit of research and he he averaged about 13 kilometers an hour for that race 28 k's however in the downwind in order to get that 13 average for the downwind piece, you have to you have to average like fifteen to sixteen kilometers an hour, and then in the headwind you have to average eleven. I worked that out, and the difference with Kevin is that he did the same speed in the second lap as the first lap. So he 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 didn't no one he didn't get faster than anyone. Everyone else just got slower in the second lap. So. Yeah, this is just a little bit of advice there. Uh, I know that it's funny that you ask this question is about beats per minute. Is that actually last night I had a dream that I was on an erg and I was getting tested for my heart rate. And whoever was testing me said, man, you got a really high heart rate. Like, and you haven't even started yet. And <laughs> it's quite funny because that's kind of me. Like, I've had races where I've had my chest strap, heart rate chest strap on. And I'm pretty sure I've averaged over 180 beats for the entire race like two hours plus don't know if that's even possible but 
chest straps are pretty reliable so unless something was happening i don't know if if that's a good or bad thing but um yeah it it happened anyway multiple times yeah i don't worry too much about heart rate you know like even in my training plans i've got heart rate there but don't let it be your one or be all because you're gonna have days where you're like tight you know when you're pushing yourself to the you're pushing your limits to try and break your break your plateaus and get better you're gonna fall into like levels of fatigue that you're not really n normally comfortable with and there's gonna be days where like you just can't get your heart rate up to the right zone but that doesn't mean that you shouldn't be out there putting in the work you know so don't let don't stress if you go out for a session and you know it's a zone you just got to get up to zone four for this 10 minute piece or five minute piece whatever and it just cut it doesn't happen it's okay just just you know unless you're really on the verge of like getting overuse injuries or whatever just get it done just get out there get it done if you're not hitting the zone that's fine at least you're out there doing the intervals it's more than you know it's better than actually just not going out and not doing anything because i you know well sometimes but hey this is when you're in the building phase if you want to if you really want to take your performance to the next level you're going to have to go through those stages of fatigue and the best time to do that is early early in the training phase like the base endurance phase you can afford to do that because the majority of the training is low intensity that's where you really forge the new level of volume that you you get your body used to you know best to do it there rather than the the peak training phase where you're got a lot more intervals and high intensity training so you got to do your your ground your groundwork first so my training plans always start with a base base endurance phase now next question how frequently do you train already answered that one six days a week i like to get on the water ideally you know some of those days would be double yeah so it all depends on time do you train in the morning on an empty stomach yes that's that's a good question and i'd say for it's not a bad idea it's not a bad way to train because like most of the time most often or not you've had dinner the night before and so you've you've had you know and if you've had carbs and for dinner then you're, you're gonna your muscles are gonna have some energy to train you know it's not like you're you're fasted but doesn't mean that you're depleted so i find that training first thing in the morning on an empty stomach is good it's good as long as you've got some overall like you know over the day you're 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 getting enough energy and 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 protein and whatnot to sustain a decent level of training then you're good if you're completely fasting like in terms of like carbless just don't expect that your training is going to be like very high intensity high quality stuff the more you limit the carbohydrate then the more you rely on your fat stores which is good but remember that it's going to be a lot of that's going to be low intensity lower lower intensity stuff which isn't bad because you're building your engine that way so yeah do train on empty stomach just got to make sure to get up early and train that's all <laughs> like i didn't do that this morning i'm planning on training sometime today uh this afternoon so I already had breakfast when are you coming back to hawaii to paddle uh oh man i would love to get there for the solo but no i'm miss missing the solo this year i'll make bigger plans to come back for that next year and uh again i've only really made plans up until hilo so i'm i'm going to be there in in august you know one way or another as i'm coaching the new zealand men's team so yeah see you in hilo uh what is your fave canoe five ah of course and uh Ares OC1 and a Vega Surfski. Those are my favorites. How much percentage high intensity versus volume training do you do for 500 meters? Oh, did I answer this one last? I think I answered this one last time. It's about 50 50. Uh, here we go. I'm trying to find some questions that I haven't answered. And I know I've got some on my laptop, just so bear with me. I'm just going to pull them up in front of me. These are some of the old ones, and we'll make sure that. I don't double up on some of these questions that I've already answered. Breathing techniques while racing slash training. Hmm. To be honest, I don't have like a really specific breathing technique, but like when I notice that I'm really pushing, 
I just try and really focus on like breathing out, you know, and <laughs> that's such a simple way to put it, but like either I, I kind of make it, I don't know. I get this from Tahiti. I think the Tahitians tend to do this. Like they make it known that they're breathing in terms of when they breathe out, they, you can hear them like ap apologies if this is loud, but it's like, they all do this type of thing. Like whether it's like on the start line of the race, <sighs> You know, you're just being, you know, you're having some intent behind your, your breathing out of your carbon dioxide, I guess. And it's kind of helps you to control like a long exhale. You know, um, they also in Tahiti, they have a call called souffle, souffle, which is like breathe. And that means like, it, it kind of means to go onto your long and strong, but also as you're doing your long and strong, you have to like breathe out with it. So that's the only real breathing technique I, I have, you know, I don't try and like, I don't necessarily try and match my breaths to my stroke. Cause especially when the stroke goes really high, although I have heard some breathing, you know, coaches talk about that, but yeah, I don't know. It's a bit like heart rate. You want to try and keep it low as much as possible, I guess. How and when you use your Concept 2 rowing machine in your training regimen. So I use my erg when I can't necessarily get on the water, especially around working days. Like if I'm doing a 12 hour shift, then it's pretty hard to get on the water, you know, unless I'm getting on the water in the dark time. And especially in the winter time, there's just no light left around work. So I'll get up early and do a quick session in the morning on the erg before I go to work and then I'll either get on the water in the afternoon after work if there's some daylight or just paddle in the dark or if it's really bad I'll come come home again and get another session on the erg on my days that I'm not working though then I'll definitely try and get on the water unless it's just I just unless I just get caught up and I just it's just just as easy for me to get on the erg but I, I advocate for water time for sure, especially if you're new and you're still developing all of the, the skills required. But for me, it's the erg is a form of, it's, it's really, it helps. It definitely helps. Next question. How would you integrate the Vaka Pedal Cadence Center into sprint training? Maybe it's important when you do break down your sprint sessions, you know, so like it's probably not, very it's probably not that useful when you're doing a full 500 meter sprint and running through your full race strategy because it's just too much to kind of focus on and break down but let's say you broke down your 500 like let's say you focus on one aspect of your sprints and that was like starts and for the first 30 seconds you wanted to try you wanted to measure your average stroke rate for that 30 seconds you know and if your goal was to like hit 90, then it's a good way to use the cadence center sensor to get you up to that 90. Whereas the rest of the race, you know, you're not going to maintain 90, you know, it might drop down to 70 or something like that. So maybe it's, a, it's good when you break your sessions down into this, you know, I often break my training plans down into starts, the middle of the race, whether that's speed endurance and even the finish you know, so like you, when you're breaking it down or you're breaking it down by energy systems, ATP, PC systems, lactic systems, you, you know, your anaerobic threshold systems, like when you're doing this, it might be more important to use the Vaca pedal cadence sensor, but it's just another measure that you can use to, to kind of give you an idea of where you're at. Sometimes you just don't really know what your stroke rate is. If it's just it's you out there without a device like that. V1 sprint starts, stroke rate at start and how it should change once it has reached constant speed. Ah, well, I just kind of touched on that. Like the start, you know, for the first 10 seconds, you've got that free energy from the ATP system. I say free energy because it's stored in the muscle and it's like you don't need to take a breath to do it, to, to get it. So you can afford to really, like if you're well rested, you can afford to really give it all at the start for two to a degree. If you give it all for the start and keep giving it all, then eventually you're going to hit the, you're going to hit the wall due to, you know, muscular fatigue from the lactic, lactic acid accumulation. But if you can go, if you can 
have a really good start in such a in a really short period of time like sub 10 to 15 seconds type thing then start to bring that rate back down or you know then then you're going to be a lot better off in that in that race as, as opposed to like pushing 100 percent, 100 percent, 100 percent. by the time you get to the 250 you're kind of toast and you st- start losing your speed but a good race strategy allows you to have something at the finish so yeah i don't know you, stroke rate needs to get up there for sure however there's two different ways of doing it like you can have a low stroke rate but really good strong connection and be working as hard as someone who has a really high stroke rate but isn't like fully sinking the paddle if that makes sense so it kind of depends on who you are and what works for you i think that the lighter paddlers can have the really high stroke rate and they're not necessarily sinking the paddle as much whereas the heavier stronger paddlers they can you know they can work on a lower stroke rate but have more power in the water and it really comes down to you know what you prefer for me i i try and get it up there but um yeah not too much that it impacts the middle and the end of my race that makes sense difference between women and men's paddling technique that's a really good question it's a really good question and i just off the top of my head like over the years what i've probably seen to be the case is that Men tend to have a lot more upper body strength and so more like the chest and the shoulders. Therefore, men tend to sit up, sit more upright than women because it's a little bit like I I compare it to like the stand up pedal stand. Like when the force becomes so great on the on the pedal, on the on the blade, when it becomes really difficult to pull the the and you can't stand you can't paddle standing upright you know you've got you don't have a lot of power so you kind of have to like lean over and really put your body into it so i noticed that when you're sitting in a canoe intent the men or women who tend to have a stronger upper body in the sense of like chest muscles shoulders arms they can sit upright and kind of more focus more on rotation but men or women so um, yeah um, I'll, I'll just kind of generalize it men or women who lack the upper body strength tend to lean stay in the like lent over and and more kind of uh work on hunched o- like hunched over so that they can get more of their weight onto the pedal if that makes sense not a bad thing both of them are not not bad like it's just it's just the way that you derive power like there's no right or wrong stroke you know you could technically you could learn how to paddle backwards super fast <laughs> if you did enough time paddling backwards but yeah it's still a good question so i don't know if you are someone that lacks upper body strength then maybe that's a focus for you if you're someone that has a lot of upper body strength and maybe maybe the, but you're still struggling maybe you need to do the opposite maybe you didn't need to do a little bit more um you know leaning into it and using the body who knows it's in the six man it's just important that everyone's doing the same thing next question balancing strength training versus on water paddling if you can only train six times a week does paddling trump strength training my first opinion yes yes paddling does trump strength training But I come from a particular view point. Like for me, I'm, I always say this, like I'm naturally strong. So I don't know what it's like to be like 60 kilos and strength is my weakness. So who knows for a paddler that is 60 kilos, maybe a bit of strength training, you know, once, twice a week is more important for them. To, to, to really close that gap because let's say paddling on the water is highly aerobic you know unless you're doing like 10 second 30 second sprints or maybe you're doing maybe you're doing uh resistance training on the water however otherwise it's quite aerobic so pretty hard to develop strength pure strength you know obviously strength isn't the end or be all it's power is the end or be all or power endurance so maybe it is a little bit more important and if 
if you can't get on the water six times a week, then gym is better than nothing. You know, three waters and three gym, or two gyms is better than just three waters, you know, water training. So it, it does depend. It does depend. And sprints are more sprint, tra- uh, like sprints, definitely strength training is more important. Six man paddling strength training is more important. However, don't forget to get that on water specific stuff, especially in the last few weeks leading into a race okay we are currently sitting at 35 minutes so i'm going to do one more question and maybe we'll have to do a part three for this because oh sorry difference in training for 30 year and 60 year old paddlers injury injury prevention for aging paddlers thank you thanks to boo thank you for the question it's an interesting one so the only experience i have is i'm 30s i'm 30 and you know i can paddle six days a week, you know, 10, 10 to 11 hours a week on the water, add in a run and a couple of gyms in there. And that's a pretty big training week for me. You know, that's near peak, peak load, I'd say for me at this, at this point in my, my life, my parents are both 60 plus my father's 65, still training, still competing. So is my mother still training, competing. They're both doing helo this year. Now, I know that they probably aren't getting quite getting full six days on the week tra- water water time. However, I know that they can do at least an hour a day, uh, whether that's on the water or sometimes they've, I, I got them an erg as well. So they do sometimes they'll do a session on the erg around around work and sometimes they've got the mokos, the, the niece and you know, their grandchildren around you know, for the weekend. So they, they get their session in the home gym or on the erg. Yeah. I mean, you just, the way that I write my training plans help to cater to all different levels. So like I have the novice plan, the intermediate aunts then elite plan. And that just basically scales the, it's the same training plan, just different volume. Like, so you still go through all the same phases and, and, and that is just, you know, can you paddle three times a week or can you paddle six times a week? That's the difference. So, you know, as long as you're not doing anything crazy, like lifting crazy weights too early, you know, you're, you're, you're not just cr- increasing your water time w- really quickly. As long as you're starting at your level and slowly progressing, then you should be all right. So... Yeah, if my if my parents 60 plus can, you know, still paddle like my dad came down and did the 30k race on the same 30k race that I did with his team. You you know what you can do. But um yeah, listening to the body is important. Doing the right exercise, technique, technique and everything. Technique and on the water, but also technique in the gym too. You know, it's easy that the number one place that you're going to get injured is in the gym, I'd say in the gym. And it's usually because you put the weight up a little bit too much because you just want, you know, you, you're thinking uh, more is better, but I'd rather you kept the weight, weight low, but had good technique and over time. You're going to, you're going to like, really, it's going to be more beneficial for, for your paddling. You know, you don't want to, you know, hurt yourself in the gym or push yourself in the gym so hard that it's just like when you get on the water you're just like completely toast you can't have a quality session on the water so just take your time whether you're or alternatively just don't do any of the land training stuff don't do any of the gym stuff just just paddle and maybe do some a little bit of cross training whether that's like cycling or walking or you know um, that's my advice anyway. It's, it's, it all comes on a, comes down to the individual and, um, yeah. Anyway, guys, we've done another 40 minutes and we still haven't finished all of the questions, but so I guess there's going to have to be a part three. Hope you guys enjoyed this one. Hope the audio and the video kind of pulls through because the, the Wi-Fi isn't very stable, but, uh, yeah. Thank you guys for listening again. Check out channellikeaking.com new training plans oh and by the way the team training plans are finished i just need to get the video component finished for them might do that today and uh yeah 
we'll have uh, the team training plans ready for you guys for train for those of you training for Hilo or any other race, maybe the Molokai, you know, maybe a local race in 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 your you know home country. The training plans are only available in sixteen weeks. Because if you're really planning to do a race, you may as well make the most of it and and plan early. Don't just four weeks, you know, not just going to prepare for four weeks as a team. 16 weeks minimum. We've got, it's an elite plan. You self uh, prescribe yourself the volume because I want to give you what's truly possible. Something that you can kind of put on your wall in your club and be like, this is all, you know, if you did all of the sessions, great, but you don't have to. If you're a novice, you can do two to three of these. If you're intermediate, you can do four. Advanced, you can do five of the six. And then if you're the elite of the elite, you can do six plus. So that's how the team training plans will work. And, uh, yeah, look forward to getting those out to you guys. Thanks for listening. Catch you guys on the next episode.